Hello. Wherever you are and whenever you're watching, welcome to Kilman Parish Church. This is the online version of our worship for Sunday, the 8th of August, 2021. Now, we call God Almighty. Do we really believe that to be true? Does his sovereignty extend beyond the walls of our church? We're not the first ones to ask this question, and we won't be the last. But if anyone is qualified to help us find the answers, it has to be the first followers of Jesus. They've gone through the horrors of his crucifixion, and they've come to terms with the wonders of his resurrection. Filled with the Holy Spirit, they're putting their lives online to tell everyone that Jesus lives. Messiah and God, yes. Peter and John, the apostles and the believers, are uniquely qualified. But to prepare ourselves, um, we'll first pray together. Let us pray. Sovereign Lord, you made heaven and earth and everything in them. In love, you shape plans and purposes for everyone. You design more and better life than we can even dream of. Peace, justice, truth and grace are your building blocks. Strong God, you offer us true security. Instead, we scrabble for straps of power. We grasp at flimsy things. In panic, we lash out. Because we are foolish, we pretend that you don't exist. We make so much noise that we cannot hear you. Almighty God, forgive us, we pray. Look past our posturing. Pardon our cruel plotting. In your mercy, shake our lives free of self-imposed burdens. Fill us with freedom. And may your spirit be our confidence and our courage. Loving God, the powers who thought that we were killing Jesus of Nazareth were in fact fulfilling your intention to save all of humankind. The cross turned evil upon itself. The resurrection smashed the dominion of death. And now your son reigns, our Lord and Saviour. Nothing and no one can ever defeat you. With this certainty we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Alison and Jason. Peter and John have been worked over by the religious rulers. The apostles' arrest would not have been gentle, and their overnight accommodation while they awaited trial, somewhat lacking in luxury. And they've been threatened never again to speak to anyone in the name of Jesus, the very same people who, along with the Romans, had killed Jesus. For me, <laughs> I'd be heading on the first donkey out of Jerusalem. Jesus of Nazareth? Never heard of him. But Peter and John take a very different tack. Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. And so the great manifesto for the church is spoken into the historical record. Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. For me, well, I'm in awe of the clear-sighted courage of Peter and John. But where does that courage come from? What do Peter and John see that I struggle to glimpse? And what about the other believers, now numbering in the thousands? Will they take fright, drop Jesus, and head for the hills, or the plains, valleys, villages, and towns from whence they came? This is an amazing story, 
that should instruct and inspire us. But before Alison reads the next chapter, I invite you to join me in prayer. Lord God, we're about to read from the Bible. Give us pause to feel the gravity of your truth, the lightness of your love, the incalculable privilege of being the children to whom you speak. Amen. Our reading is from Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 31. The believers pray. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. We did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hands to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Amen. And we thank God for reminding us that he is God and we are not. You know, it's a real temptation to peddle the pound shop version of Jesus. It won't cost you much because he's not worth much. Come on, just believe in Jesus. No change is necessary. Just, you can keep doing what you're doing, just in a nicer and happier way. Turn up occasionally at church, and Jesus will call it even. He's a good guy. Now, I'm not saying that I've ever believed that, and mostly I've managed to resist. But are Jesus and his church not a tough sell? Not so for the believers. Nothing about following this freshly crucified Messiah was safe or easy. And here's Paul and John turning up with a tale of incarceration and dire threats against even mentioning the name of Jesus. And yet, the believers believe. They really believe. Maybe they've only known Jesus for a few months or weeks. But when they encounter Jesus, they discover God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whom they see with the eyes of faith. Theirs is a simple clarity, which is far from simplistic. They see themselves in God's eternal story. The God of eternity gives them all the wisdom and courage they need for their present. That's what belief looks like. Do you recognize it? And do you recognize God? Sovereign, strong, and with a very, very long view of things. The believers address God as sovereign Lord. And they really mean that. God is sovereign. He is in charge. He is the supreme authority. How does that sit with you? Because believing that God is sovereign often seems counterintuitive. Not because of some philosophical argument, but because we live in the real world. So let's see why the believers address God as sovereign and mean it. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. Can we go back any further than that? Even today, science can only take us back to what we now call the Big Bang. I'm sure that wasn't yesterday, 
But the only way that we can understand what happened 15 billion years ago, before there was anything, is to look for someone. Belief in at least the possibility of a creator God is certainly on the rise across the scientific world. One Christian who's an astrophysicist writes, The harder I look, the more of God's handiwork I see. I can understand design while appreciating the designer. Science discovers and describes the internal logic of God's creation. Science raises questions that are too big for science. The curious nature points beyond itself, raising questions of order and existence that are best explained by a divine mind. And I've put a link to this full article online. I am awed by the confidence with which those first believers were able to handle the longest of long views about God and what he's about. So, to them, a mere thousand years must have seemed like yesterday as they looked to Psalm 2, what God was saying through King David. The logic of that Psalm is unassailable. Who can be greater than their creator? Why do human beings get angry with them? Well, I mean, just what is the point? Why do we make plans that don't involve God? Why do we plot together against him and then still blame God? And what's changed? How often have you listened to someone, maybe yourself, explain that there's no way that they're going to worship a God who doesn't give them what they think they're entitled to? <laughs> when that happens with me, that's always when I know that I'm in a bad place with God. And, and, and why do we waste time making plans that don't involve God? And I don't mean a quick prayer telling God what we've already decided. And who are we falling in with because we've fallen out with God? Contrast two influences you when you're in a good place with God and when you're not. So we come to the crucifixion of Jesus. Who was really in charge? Afraid of the Roman crowd, the Jewish rulers are desperate not to upset the religious authorities whom they hate. And the Romans fear Jewish unrest, but despise the Jews. And the crowd grumbles this way and that. But they all gather together against the Lord and against his Messiah. What absolute folly. We're told in the passage that Allison read, everything they did, everything the Jews and the Gentiles did to kill Jesus was determined beforehand according to God's will. God who birthed the world also planned to die on the cross in Jerusalem. As the French theologian Henri Blochet explains, evil is conquered as evil. Because God turns it back upon itself. He makes the supreme crime, the murder of the only righteous person, the very operation that abolishes sin. The maneuver is utterly unprecedented. No more complete victory could be imagined. Now we know. This is why the believers call God sovereign and Jesus Messiah. This is why they will not be terrorized into abandoning Jesus. Instead, they ask God for boldness to preach his word and to do great and miraculous things through the name of Jesus. And their prayer was answered. God made his mighty presence known. The meeting place shook. All the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, and yes, they did preach the word of God with boldness. So, beware calling God Sovereign Lord. We, this church, we might be shaken up. And beware looking beyond today's little bubble. We might glimpse eternity. 
and beware giving God his place as creator, we might become bold to speak of Jesus and beware of speaking of Jesus. We might start doing amazing, healing, restoring things here in our communities and our families. And we wouldn't want that, would we? Amen, and to God alone be the glory. And Jason will now lead us in our prayers for others. It is our prayer for the world. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we watch the news on our televisions, and we read the news in our newspapers. We listen to the news on our radios, and we read about it in our phones, laptops, and other electronic devices. We see the fires in Italy, Greece, and Turkey, floods in the Sudan, Niger, and Tanzania, and we watch the horrors of war in Afghanistan and Syria. We see the refugee problem in Nicaragua, Colombia, and Mexico. Whether it's a global pandemic or global climate change, it always seems to be bad news. Lord, can we be forgiven for thinking that we're in a hopeless, helpless situation? God, help us to remember that without you, we are hopeless and helpless, but that with you, we can achieve anything. So Lord, please help us find not just solutions to our problems, but solutions that show your hand in these solutions. Your hand, your compassion, your love, and your great power. Help us to solve not only worldwide problems, but our own local problems and personal problems as well. With you, all things are possible. In Jesus' name, amen. I can't do that again, Alan. I can't.
And now may the Sovereign Lord bless us and all whom we love, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.